Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer 40k lore. This week, we're going to start ourselves a little bit of a two-parter. After we talked recently about how the Imperium defends itself from external threats, I thought it would be interesting to have a look at the same scenario, but in the exactly opposite kind of circumstances. Whilst the Imperium is massive and uses its size both to fight its wars and to determine where and when to fight those wars, the Tau Empire is, by galactic standards, absolutely microscopic. And so it lacks the benefits that the Imperium has. It does not have time, it does not have space, and it does not have near infinite resources of manpower and materiel. But what it does have is a fully centralized command structure, able to communicate with even the most far-flung portions of the Tau Empire within hours at the absolute most. They also have the benefit of being able to defend only a very small area of space, whilst the Imperium will at any given day be under attack on a thousand different worlds in a thousand different sectors. And obviously, these rather pronounced differences means that the two empires have wildly different ways of defending themselves. And today, we're going to be looking at the Tau Empire. And if you haven't seen the video talking about how the Imperium defends itself yet, then I'll try to remember to put a link in the description down below. I will also be splitting this topic into two videos. Today we're going to be talking about how the Tau Empire defends itself in total, on a strategic and logistical level, and in the next video we will be talking about how they defend an individual planet against any would-be invader. So, without further ado, let's get on with it. First and foremost, it is important to understand that the Tau Empire is, well, not really much of an empire at all. The Tau are a very strange race in the 41st millennium, in that they are constantly presented as a major player on the galactic stage, when in reality, if any of the other major powers so much as farted in their general direction, it would in all due likelihood be the end of the Tau Empire. And the Tau themselves are not ignorant of this inconvenient truth. When they first left their homeworld, they thought that the entire galaxy was theirs for the taking. That they had a right, a destiny to rule over every single planet and every single solar system, by sheer virtue of the seemingly self-evident fact that the greater good was the one and only correct philosophy out there. And thusly, no alien race, once presented with the obvious and clear superiority of Tau philosophy, would ever refuse unity with the Tau race. And initially, this seemingly wild and somewhat naive assumption appeared to be correct. Whilst the Tau Empire certainly ran into resistance here and there, it was by and large sporadic and undetermined. The space around the Tau homeworld was a fairly safe area, by 40k standards. Most of the Xenos races that inhabited it were either intelligent enough to be convinced by Tau rhetoric, or weak enough to be handled without too much in the way of problems. And the Tau were true to their words. They greeted these races and integrated them into their own empire, and treated them almost <laughs> as equal citizens. Now, there were the occasional mishaps, for example, on one occasion, the Tau essentially wiped out the entire population of a world via smallpox blankets. Basically. Purely by accident, of course, and the fact that the planet was excellently situated and rich on natural resources and minerals, and swiftly thereafter became one of the Tau's capital sept worlds, well... Coinky dinks all around, no doubt. And even more fortunately for the Tau, in their case, diversity really did appear to be a strength. Now, the Tau Empire consists of 18 different species, including the Tau themselves, and several of these species have highly specialized roles within Tau society. For example, the Brachiura, 
This race of tiny little crustaceans is blessed with many exceptionally dexterous limbs, and due to their small size, this allows them to work in miniature in a virtually unmatched fashion. They produce both advanced electrical circuitry and miniaturized technology with high tolerance requirements for the Tau. Whilst the Nikasar are giant floating pancake space bears, yes, really, who are also incredibly adapted to travelling through the void. And as luck would have it, this race, who are really good at travelling in space and have psychic abilities to make short skips through the warp, was also the very first race that the Tau encountered. Lucky that. <laughs> very, very lucky. Almost too lucky, in fact. The famously psychically inert Tau, lacking in the technology to truly cross interstellar distances, being found right next to another species who are so perfectly adept at doing just that. It's almost as if it was planned, but that is of course completely impossible. Not like there was a major Xeno species way way back in the day that had a bit of a fetish for these things or anything. Now, complete coincidence I'm certain. Or alternatively, a possible case of good old fashioned Plotus Pointus. But hey, details. And it's not like the Tau's luck would continue forever. Once, as mentioned, they ran into a surprising quantity of cooperative Xeno species that also happened to have skills that were very useful to the Tau Empire, be they in the realms of technology, in travel, or in warfare, they eventually ran into a considerably less cooperative species, humanity. They seem to be outwardly hostile, and vehemently so as well. They condemned any and all contact with the Tau Imperium, refused their traders, shot their diplomats, and seemed set on open warfare. Or at least, outwardly, that appeared to be the case. But when the Tau slowly but surely managed to get in contact with various ruling nobles or planetary governors, it became apparent that humanity was a somewhat fractious race. The high and mighty nobles would take plentiful bribes in the form of Xeno's technology or currency, whilst still outwardly condemning the Tau Imperium. But the Tau did not mind. Once they managed to get a foothold in human society, they figured they could begin subverting it from the inside out. They could begin slowly infiltrating, gaining more and more privileges. First, it was merely just giving gifts to planetary nobles. This eventually turned into a minor trade treaty on very specific goods. This then expanded into a bit more of a treaty with yet further goods. And eventually, the market was virtually flooded with, it must be said, superior Tau versions of Imperial technology. Better Vox casters, better ovens, better housing, better ground speeders, better... well, everything, pretty much. Inevitably, this led to a surge in support for the Tau. Many loyal Imperial citizens figured that, well... Maybe the Xenos aren't so bad after all. Their way of life sure as hell seems a lot more comfy than ours, and it's not like they're asking us to give up our religion, our freedom or our planet either. All they seem to be asking for is coexistence. Maybe, just maybe, we'll give that a shot. The Tao strategy of subversive infiltration was working, and I'm sure the Tau at the time had a good little laugh at the humans, stating that they were part of the Imperium of Man, as if it was the Imperium, the only Imperium, the only major force. <laughs> How naive of them. Did they not know that the Tau Empire was the only true empire? Surely, surely they are exaggerating, the Ethereals must have said to themselves, when they say that their empire was mind-numbingly vast, that there were worlds in their supposed Imperium with larger populations than the entirety of the Tau Empire. And then the Damocles Gulf Crusade happened. 
And the Tau suddenly and brutally came to the realization that if anything, those tiny, scattered, underpopulated worlds out on the Imperium's very uttermost fringes, they had been understating the reality of the Imperium quite drastically. For whilst by Imperial standards, the Damocles Crusade force was a virtually pitiful one, consisting of a measly few million men scattered across a few dozen regiments and the Imperial Navy elements along with but a single Titan Legion, a force hardly worthy of the title of Crusade, indeed the title had probably more to do with the naming sense of the Adeptus Astartes rather than the true Imperial classification of one. The Space Marines committed elements of eight different chapters, making them proportionally the most valuable contribution. The Crusade would go on to last for a mere three years and affect four sectors before an armistice was called, making it one of the smallest, shortest, and least effective Crusades in Imperial history. But from the Tau's perspective, it looked an awful lot more like the end of the bloody world. Firstly, they never thought that anything out there would have this much force. And secondly, they could never have imagined an enemy as ruthless as the Imperium. When the Imperium took control of a Tau world, they simply massacred the entire population. When they arrived at the world that they couldn't be bothered to invade, they bombarded it from orbit, melting the polar ice caps and killing all 7 million Tau civilians on the planet, rendering it also useless not only for the Tau, but for the Imperium, for God Emperor only knows how many centuries. For the Imperium, rendering a world useless for a few hundred years was no big deal. By the time the Administratum even received the report, a hundred or so would probably already have passed, but for the Tau, whose entire empire consisted of less than 40 worlds, it was inconceivable. And the fact that the Imperium also appeared to be waging a war of flat out mass extermination against the Tau was the height of horror. The Tau Empire learned many lessons from the Imperium, and the first and foremost of them was that the galaxy was not as happy-go-lucky a place as the Tau had assumed. But why am I telling you all of this? Why am I going on this seemingly unrelated tangent about the history between the Imperium and the Tau? Well, it is because at the end of the Damocles Gulf Crusade, the Tau defensive strategy as we know it today was born. And one of the key tenets of that defensive strategy was to quite simply not poke the space monster. If the Tau Empire was to survive, it had to expand, this is true, but it was also equally true that if it expanded too quickly and annoyed its neighbors too much, it would also be squashed necessitating a careful balancing act between grabbing the odd, occasional, isolated, discontent imperial world here and there, and being spiky enough of a proposition so that it could say, ah, uh, uh, Imperium, I didn't do much. If you step on me now, I am very spiky and I will make you bleed. Is it really worth it? Think carefully on that now. And of course, the second part of that threat necessitates the Tau Empire being spiky enough to not be worth the bother. And this necessity has only grown as the Tau Empire learned that, well, the Imperium was a major threat to be sure, but there are other things out there as well. When the Dark Eldar raided Peck, leaving behind mountains of mutilated corpses, that got the Tau damn nervous indeed. When they ran into the Tyranids, that didn't help their disposition much either. And the Orcs, well, the Tau have never been overly fond of the Orcs. The further the Tau Empire expands, the more the Tau begin to realize that they need to focus more and more 
on simply just staying alive in a seemingly increasingly hostile galaxy. So, how does the Tau do it? How do they defend what is so rightfully theirs? And how do they ensure that they do not get overwhelmed by more and more threats? Well, the first part in any successful defense is ensuring that you actually have the manpower and the material required to defend yourself. And in the case of the Tau, this necessitates expansion. Whilst in the case of the Imperium of Man, it is more than happy just maintaining what it has, the Tau Empire is painfully aware of the fact that if it does not get access to more resources and more living space, then it will forever be a seventh-rate power in the galaxy, existing purely at the mercy of the larger powers. So expansion is a necessity. But how to do so without courting retribution? That is the question. The Tau Empire now spends virtually all of its influence and time in planning out just how to do that. First and foremost, they look around their immediate area and find places that they can take over without a whole lot of resistance. Isolated, dissatisfied Imperial worlds are probably one of the best prospects, since these can usually be conquered almost exclusively through political and economical means, only requiring a very minor Tau military presence at the very end of that long and careful process. This does come with the potential risk of annoying the Imperium again, but as long as it's more of a tickle and less of a poke, the response is likely to be manageable. Maybe Subsector Command will dispatch a minor task force to maintain control of the world, or maybe a slightly larger one to reclaim control in case it has already switched sides. In these cases, the Tau feel relatively confident that they can win any minor skirmishes that the Imperium will send their way. And if the Imperium was to react with a bit more force than the Tau had originally anticipated, then worst case scenario, they will simply abandon the world and retreat into Tau space, where a small Imperial force is unlikely to pursue them. The most appetizing prospect, of course, would be the worlds owned by various minor Xenos races, but the Tau have pretty much exhausted that particular resource in their immediate space, and whilst there are still Xenos races around, well, a frightening proportion of those are green, loud, and exceptionally undiplomatic. Whilst Orc worlds are still a possibility, and in many cases preferable to Imperial worlds, since they usually belong to fairly minor Orc empires unable to send the sheer amount of fuck you back at the town that the Imperium is, taking an Orc world is unavoidably a purely military undertaking. There is no diplomatic approach to be had with the Orcs, and believe you me, the Tau have tried, with precisely the level of success you would expect. In fact, it was the Orcs who taught the Tau another vital lesson, namely that not all races can be reasoned with, and sometimes shoot on sight is an entirely reasonable foreign policy. And so if expansion is necessary, which it is, and room to expand into is starting to get damn limited, which it is as well, then the only real option is to make sure that you're ready to survive the backlash. And the first line of defense in weathering any potential storm is the Tau Navy, which has gone through some quite drastic changes as well after the encounter with the Imperium. Originally, the Tau Navy was known as the Corvatra, and its primary focus was on mercantile activity and diplomacy. It was armed, and armoured to a degree, but there were no truly dedicated warships within the Corvatra. This design philosophy quickly demonstrated its flaws and shortcomings during the Damocles Gulf Crusade, where it suffered heavy casualties at the hands of the Imperial Navy. For many Xenos races, this would have been disastrous. Their tried and tested technology was proven to be ineffective, 
It could take decades, if not centuries, for the race in question to fully re-evaluate and redevelop their views on void warfare, and then redesign and actually build the ships required to fulfill the new requirements. But due to the extremely centralized nature of the Tau Empire, and the fact that virtually all leadership decisions are taken by a single unified leadership clan, it took mere years. Once the Ethereals had decided amongst one another that a new fleet formation would be formed and named Kor Orvesh, or Combat Fleet, they immediately ordered the aircast members who had engaged in combat against the Imperium to lay down a plan for what they needed to have in order to engage the Imperial Navy in open combat. And once those plans were done, the Earthcast was simply ordered to begin construction of the new patterns of ships immediately. There was no politicking, there was no discussion, there were no arguments, there were no long drawn out committee meetings or allocations of resources and monetary compensation for the production of the new ships or the need to recruit new personnel. Every single decision was simply taken by the ethereal castes and then passed down the line as an unquestionable order to the earth and air caste. This resulted in an entirely new combat fleet growing forth within the Tau Empire in record time, one that would become one of the most powerful in the galaxy, if not in numbers, then at the very least in the sheer performance of each individual vessel. Already the Tau Merchant Fleet had been a bit of a nasty surprise for the Imperium of Man, due to their heavy reliance upon massed numbers of highly accurate drone-guided torpedoes. Due to the Tau Empire being exempt from the usual rules of the 41st millennium, that any and all attempt at creating even the most basic form of AI will inevitably lead to that AI rising up against its masters, they are able to utilize far better guidance technology than the Imperium is. The extraordinarily rudimentary cogitator guidance systems on board the Imperium's torpedoes are very hit and miss. Occasionally, it can guide itself into an enemy vessel with devil precision and accuracy. Other times it might happily ignore even the vastest of vessels parked right in front of it. The Tau torpedoes, however, they leaned considerably more towards the devilish accuracy side of things. The primary reason why the Imperial Navy had been able to inflict such stinging defeats upon the Tau Merchant Navy was due to the fact that the Tau had virtually no close-range defenses and zero broadside potential. And so the moment that the Imperial ships got close or their lighter escorts and frigate-class vessels got in amongst the Tau ships, they caused absolute havoc, raking them with broadside macro cannon batteries and unleashing their own torpedoes at point blank range. The new Tau combat vessels would be far better rounded. They would still possess vast banks of torpedoes, as that would remain the Tau's primary weapon, seeking to engage the enemy at the absolute extremity of their own range. But they would also possess considerable mid-range potential in the form of several banks of lance-equivalent weaponry. And finally, if the enemy got up close and personal, several more groupings of railguns should hopefully be enough to chase off small Imperial frigates and escort vessels. But the railguns were almost exclusively a measure of last resort. Instead, the Tau had noticed that their ability to put large numbers of strike crafts into the void had caused the Imperium no small amount of problems. As the Tau heavy bombers, fighters, and interceptors proved themselves to be quite superior to their Imperial equivalents. And whilst a single fighter, interceptor, or bomber would stand no chance against even the lightest Imperial escort vessel, a hundred of them, all dumping their own heavy-grade munitions into the void, well, that is a threat to any light ship. And even should the strike craft fail to inflict any substantial damage upon the escort, that in and of itself does not actually matter, since the primary purpose of attacking them is not necessarily to sink them, but rather to keep them away from the main Tau fleet. The Tau, as mentioned, rely primarily upon massive barrages of intelligently guided torpedoes, which is all well and good against cruisers and larger type vessels, but against a frigate, 
Well, those are fast, nippy little bastards, and space is, well, a very, very large space. You could fire a thousand torpedoes into it, and a frigate would still have plenty of places left to run to. And make no mistake, even something like a frigate could very easily be a considerable threat to even a Tau cruiser. The Tau have not yet developed the protection necessary to stand up to the Imperium's far heavier gauge weaponry, nor are they likely to ever do so because the Tau have no intentions of engaging in a slugging match with the Imperium. They view that as an exceptionally wasteful way of fighting war, in which you virtually guarantee T to take almost as much damage as the enemy does. Thusly, if a frigate armed with a macro cannon gets up close to a Tau ship, it's going to end very badly for the blueberries. But of course, the frigate actually has to get that close in the first place, which is far easier said than done. Indeed, the Tau Navy is one of the most potent, as I think I've already mentioned, in the 41st millennium. It might not have the numbers necessary to compete with the Imperium in a large-scale engagement, but their ships are powerful enough to make a good account of themselves even whilst outnumbered. And the newfound power of the Tau Navy did not go unnoticed by the Ethereals, who placed the primary responsibility of guarding and defending the Tau Empire on the backs of the aircast and the Navy. It would be stationed primarily around the core worlds of the Tau Empire, the so-called Sept Worlds, centers of administration and governance, and also the seat of the Tau Ethereals, this fact alone, of course, makes the survival and continued security of these sept worlds of paramount importance to the continued health of the Tau Empire. Additionally, and yet further adding to the value of these worlds, they also tend to be the primary hub of manufacturing, of basing, and of training of the Empire's various armoured forces, the navy, as well as the hunter cadres of the Firecast. The Tau Empire can ill afford to lose even a single world, but the potential loss of a Sept world would be a dreadfully painful blow. And so it should come as no surprise that they are also the best defended planets in the Tau Empire, used as staging points to launch counterattacks against any enemy incursions. The Tau Sept worlds themselves act essentially as fortified strong points, where the Tau Navy and potentially the Hunter Carus as well can both sally forth from and retreat to should they be heavily pressed. This is, however, a bit of a high-risk, high-reward strategy. On the offside, it allows the Tau Empire to maintain its military might in the area where decisions can be made immediately. The local Ethereal Council will know precisely what forces they have under their immediate command, and they will also be able to determine quickly what additional forces may be needed. This allows them to both quickly dispatch an initial force, request further reinforcements along with establishing a supply and logistical line for those reinforcements, and also potentially raising up further forces from the Sept world itself. This is, however, a high-risk, high-reward strategy. Assuming everything goes well and the dispatched forces manage to assure victory, then everything's gravy. If, however, those forces should be routed, then their return back to the Sept world will both provide safety for the fleeing troops, but also invite the enemy straight into the Tau's nerve center. Though to be fair, with the size of the Tau Empire, it's not like they have all that much space to play with anyways. And the Tau, too, are painfully aware of that. When I say that a Sept world is heavily defended, I mean it. In fact, the sheer amount of defenses placed around and on a Sept world would, taking proportions into account, outclass that of most Imperial capital worlds. The Tau Sept worlds maintain hundreds of hunter cadres, and as mentioned, they are also primary bases for the Tau Navy, and they also tend to have several orbital defense platforms, and the Tau are good at making orbital defenses. 
To give you an idea of just how tough a nut a sept world is to crack, when the Damocles Gulf Crusade encountered the dull Ith sept world, it ground itself to a halt. Now again, the Damocles Gulf Crusade was hardly truly worthy of the title of a crusade, but it was still a fairly sizeable military undertaking, consisting of millions of Imperial Guardsmen and elements of eight Astartes chapters, and yet the overall commander of the crusade determined that he simply did not possess the required forces to crack the Sept world. So yeah, it is a tough old nut. But of course, it would neither be possible nor practical to defend every planet in the Tau Empire to this degree. The Sept Worlds are an exception because of how valuable they are, but most Tau planets will have to defend themselves. Although the Tau often contribute with an orbital defense station, used both obviously as a defensive bulwark and also as an area in which the Tau themselves can reside in relative safety from any potential uprisings down on the surface. It's not that the Tau don't trust the local population, it's just that they want to make sure of their loyalty before they start living amongst the savages. As for the planet side garrison, it will primarily be made up of local forces, in the most literal sense of the word as well. If it was a previous imperial world, then much of the garrison will be made up of ex-imperial citizens. These are of course viewed far more favourably in the eyes of the Tau than the general populace, as these citizens have not only chosen to defect the Tau Empire, but also chosen to take up arms and fight in the name of the Great Good. They are therefore given the honorary title of Guervesa. They are then allowed to fight alongside the Tau, although they very rarely participate in the outward expansions of the Tau Empire. Whether they choose not to or because the Tau don't trust them that much is a bit more open to interpretation, though the Tau do trust them enough to hand out their various lovely toys like their beautiful plasma rifles to them. And of course, the larger percentage of a garrison can be made up of purely local forces, the more proper Tau fire warriors are freed up to go off and fight on the front line to do the greater good's true bidding. This means that in an ideal circumstance a planet will be garrisoned almost exclusively by its local inhabitants, which also helps keeping the locals happy mind you, with only a few Tau hunter cadres remaining behind, both as a just in case oh shit security force and also to train and maintain relations with the local population, and specifically the local garrison. And this is where we get one of the few similarities between the Tau Empire and the Imperium of Man, in that neither truly expects the local garrison to do much if any good when faced with a determined enemy invasion. But the differences of course appear almost immediately once again. Whilst the Imperium will quite often simply ignore the pleas for help of a single world so as to better see if the enemy is an actual threat or not, the Tau Empire will immediately rush reinforcements to any area under threat. First and foremost, these reinforcements will take the form of Tau Navy elements, both because they are the quickest to dispatch and because they are the most suited for the immediate purpose of delaying the enemy and, if at all possible, preventing them from landing on the planet in the first place. Because of course, the very best way of defending a planet is to make sure that it never gets invaded in the first place. This is where the Tau Empire has yet another advantage or potentially a disadvantage as well in the future, in that the Tau know around about precisely how long it will take for reinforcements to reach any one area of their empire, as they utilize a different type of faster than light travel than most of the races in the 41st millennium. The Tau utilize something they refer to as a slingshot drive. This thing, ironically enough, functions more like a warp drive in our sense of the word warp drive rather than the 40k meaning of the word. In 40k of course most racers delve through the warp by either tunneling through it or submerging their vessels fully in it and utilize some form of shielding technology to protect the vessel from the vagaries of the warp storms. 
In the case of the Imperial Warp Drive, the basic idea is that you enter the warp in one area. And then, since the warp extends all across the galaxy, you can then exit again in a different part of the galaxy. This drastically speeds up travel, because inside of the warp the usual laws of physics simply do not apply. And concepts such as time or distance are also quite loose, shall we say. The downside is of course that whilst this mode of transportation is exceptionally fast, it can also not be exceptionally fast. Whilst 99% of the time it will speed up the travel quite considerably, although you never entirely know by how much, occasionally it could also slow down your rate of travel. A vessel could have been travelling for a couple months in the warp, for example, and then emerge out in real space only to learn that a few decades has passed. Alternatively, the very same vessel could pop into the warp for a couple of hours and travel trillions of miles. It is a very fast way of travelling, but it is also a very moody way of travelling, and whilst, generally speaking, the Imperium will be able to determine the amount of time it takes to travel from A to B, with a, uh, you know, month or two plus minus, which by warp travel standards is entirely fine, the Tau have a different solution. They have invented something they refer to as a slingshot drive, which ironically, based on the relatively little information we actually have about it, sounds like it might theoretically function more like how we, in our modern day science, think that a warp drive might work which is based upon an idea called the Albicuri Drive. The basic thesis is that if you wish to travel faster than light, without the various problems that such speeds would entail, like for example friction, tearing the space vessel apart, or colliding with tiny little bits of space rock, blasting tank-sized hole in the hull, you would have to somehow change space itself. And the current idea is based on not accelerating a vessel, but instead shortening the distance that vessel has to travel, by folding space in front of the spaceship. To hilariously oversimplify an example, say that you wish to travel from A to B, and there was a hundred kilometers between the two points. What you would then do is compact and fold the space between the two points, say, a million times, and then at the end of that process you would end up with the distance from A to B being one kilometer, instead of a hundred. Now of course, whether or not this theory has any correlation whatsoever to actual reality, we don't know. It's theoretically possible, because as far as we can observe now, a black hole appears to have something along the lines of a similar effect upon reality around it, slowing down time for example. But again, that's just what we can observe right now. We don't even know if that observation is correct yet. And even if we were to test this theoretical warp drive, well, um, it would require more energy than the world could currently produce, basically. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, not gonna happen, but clearly the Tau have found a way, and the advantages of their faster than life technology, although it is considerably slower, much, much, much slower, than the Imperium's version of warp drive, it is predictable. If it takes you two hours to get from point A to B once, it'll take you two hours the next time, and the next time, and the next time, and the next time, and as an added bonus, there is no chance of interplanetary space demons appearing from a hole in reality to devour the entire crew. Which one must see as a bonus. Unless you're an orc, of course, and you begin to miss the in-flight entertainment. This predictability allows the Tau to dispatch reinforcements to a planet in dire need of it, and know that they will arrive in time. It also allows them to layer their defences, placing hunter cadres in set areas of their empire, where they know that it will take so and so long for them to get to a different point, and they know, or well, their best estimate anyway tells them that the local garrison can hold out so and so long. The Tau Empire also doesn't really stop sending reinforcements. 
Whilst the Imperium of Man might consider the loss of a planet to be a bit of a bummer, but hardly a big problem, the Tau, as mentioned, can't really afford to lose planets, and so when one is under attack, they will continue to send as much reinforcements as they think is needed to keep that planet. Their idea of economy of force is completely different from that of the Imperium. The Imperium knows that it has virtually unlimited manpower and material reserves. It can simply just keep producing more regiments, more tanks, more bane blades, more spaceships, but it also knows that it has to fight a thousand wars all at once, and so it must very carefully husband the resources it has access to right now and ration them out across all of these battlefields to ensure that there is enough time for the rest of the Imperium's strength to be mobilized. This means that as far as the Imperium is concerned, a stalemate is almost as good as a victory. If they can send in just enough reinforcements to stop an enemy force, then goody. The Imperium can then inevitably increase the amount of reinforcements sent to that sector, or decrease them, if developments in other parts of the galaxy turn out to be more serious than originally anticipated. For the Imperium, its by far most valuable resource is time and it is willing to sacrifice a nearly limitless amount of any other resource in order to purchase more of it. If given enough time, the Imperium will free up enough reserves to crush virtually any threat. For the Tau, however, time is not the main issue. They can react quickly across their empire, they can dispatch additional reinforcements as and when needed. For them, economy of force is far more pragmatic. They are a small empire, they do not have infinite resources, and they certainly don't have infinite manpower, and they cannot afford a multi-front war. If they are ever forced to split their already limited resources, then the Tau Empire might swiftly begin to crumble. They can certainly sustain a few skirmishes here and there on different edges of their empire, but several massed consorted attacks upon them would be a very large problem indeed. For them, it is all about getting the maximum value out of each and every individual investment. When they get invaded, they wish to stop that invasion and route it as swiftly as possible, utilizing overwhelming firepower to deal a crushing blow to the enemy, rendering them unable to offer further resistance, and then, preferably, getting them to surrender because it takes a hell of a lot less effort and a hell of a lot less resources to march them off to a POW camp where they can potentially even be converted to the greater good, than it takes to dig them out of their fortifications, where the Tau will have to spend munitions and lives to deal with an enemy that is, de facto, already defeated. The Tau's worst nightmare scenarios would be either several major powers pushing in against them on multiple fronts simultaneously, which would necessitate the Tau Empire to split its already very limited resources both in the terms of active military personnel and future military produce across several theatres, as this will directly affect the Tau's primary advantage, superior firepower. If they simply cannot bring to bear enough tanks or enough ships, then they will eventually be outgunned. And when the Tau become outgunned, they are well and truly buggered. Another nightmare scenario would be continuous, low intensity but escalating conflicts across the Tau Empire. An assault by the Dark Eldar, for example, with constant lightning raids being launched even faster than the Tau can react upon a dozen worlds simultaneously, that would be a scenario liable to bleed the Tau dry in but a couple decades. Another very problematic enemy could also be the Orcs. Not because the Tau cannot defeat them, they've played with the Greenskins on multiple occasions before, and their tactics of overwhelming firepower tends to work quite well against a race whose primary tactic is run screaming towards the enemy, but there is of course one big problem with Orc populations, namely that they tend to regrow with frightening speed. 
And once they get their roots in on a planet, ooh, it takes a lot of effort to clear out all of those spores and little fungal formations. Effort that the Tau would rather not have to spend. And then of course there's the Tyranids. Everybody's favorite gribbly monstrosities. They have caused the Tau no end of problems. For after the defeat of High Fleet Behemoth during the Battle of Macrag, a single splinter fleet entered Tau space. This fleet has been, in my opinion, incorrectly referred to as Hive Fleet Gorgon, for it was in all due reality not a true Hive Fleet. It was but a splinter. A big fat old splinter to be sure, but most certainly not a Hive Fleet. Nevertheless, even a splinter formation of Tyranids is a complete and utter disaster for the Tau, because their first line of defense, their navy, well, there is simply no enemy against which the Tau fleet is less well suited to fighting than the Tyranids. Bear in mind, once again, that the Tau's primary weaponry are mass launchers of intelligent seeker torpedoes, and they're fighting the Nids, who can produce a quite literally limitless amount of tiny little spacefaring organisms that are more than happy to ram themselves into those torpedoes and detonate them. And if a naval engagement between the Tau and the Tyranids essentially can be broken down into a mathematical question of whether or not the Tau have more torpedoes than the Tyranid have biomass, then that engagement is one fuck of a foregone conclusion. And that is why in the next video, when we're moving on to look at how the Tau Empire defends itself on a planetary basis, we will be looking at how they resisted Splinter Fleet Gorgon. Because the Navy sure as hell didn't stop the enemy this time. That task was once again up to the humble Fire Warrior. Until next time. I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.